Um, and again, as we go through this pandemic, it's like we continue to show up here in this beautiful space with each of us, like consistently seeing your faces is wonderful. Um, so thank you for your presence and your participation here. And um, if you can, and that's appropriate for you financially, it would be wonderful if you could contribute to the um, San Francisco Dharma Collective to help support the Wellbeing Wednesday, and then also just to help support all of the great activities that are going on here. And um, your support, your financial contribution, the, the Dharma Collective does also give some of that to the teachers, which is just a nice thing to do, right? Because then that allows them to spend their time and their energy taking these deep dives into the texts and into the language and bringing that forward to us, which is, I think, as we all know and feel, an immeasurable gift. So any kind of contribution, while maybe a penance, pit, pittance, small amount, is also of great value when it's collectively given. Um, so anyway, blah, blah, blah. It tend to be kind of long-winded and abstract, but thank you, everyone. And we'll turn it over to Eve and Chandra. Thank you so much and welcome everyone to the Well of Being Wednesdays with myself and Lopan Chandra. We are so delighted to be here with you this evening. And as we've been doing <clears throat> now for 25 slogans, amazingly, making our way through diligently, we will start off with a practice in which we continue I hope, hopefully it feels like progressively, bit by bit, to familiarize ourselves with this mind and to learn tools and techniques to steady that mind. So we'll be practicing again in settling the mind in its natural state. Then we will talk a bit about what this slogan has to offer us. It's a beautiful compendium to what was shared last week, largely around how can we, I would say, be... <laughs> wise and compassionate guardians to our body, speech, and mind? How are we exerting and expressing ourselves in the world in the way that can really most support us in this journey of transformation? And we will do a, an extra special um, evening um, kind of heart practice tonight, which I, I won't spoil by giving away, but we often are doing practices that help us both open the heart, but also transform the material that might occlude or, or heavy or weight down the heart in certain ways. That's often called the Tonglen practice. So I, I recognize many familiar faces here. So lovely to see you all. And if it is your first night here, or you're only coming in here and there, so lovely to see you. Welcome, 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 welcome. The San Francisco Dharma Collective is unique in so many ways. And part of it is that each one of you is our collective every time you show up. Literally, we refresh ourselves each time in this constellation of beings. It's a volunteer run collective. We all choose to be here. We all are here as spiritual friends. And that, yeah, is actually emotional, almost, um, yeah, to the point of tears, truly, that we get to come together in this way. And our intention tonight is to really adhere as close as we can to our ethics of non-harming, showing up in a way that is conducive and supportive to one another and to ourselves. And as the San Francisco Dharma Collective, you know, our priorities revolve around non-harming in the most subtle and the most extreme ways possible. We want people to feel welcome. We want people to feel uh, as much as possible that this is a place for them. And we will do everything within our ability to make that possible. And we always welcome suggestions and ideas of how to make that even better. What we ask of you all here uh, together in our, our beautiful vehicle for moving towards awakening is that you adhere to a sense of respect and compassion, deep empathy with one another. So that's our, that's our aspiration and hope. Right? We don't learn these practices in order to use them somewhere else. We start right here, right here. And 
of course, now very, very well into this virtual time. I know that for a lot of folks, it's it's exhausting to continue looking at the screen and to have that kind of engagement. And I so appreciate uh, those who are showing up and can do that level of engagement with the screen. During the meditations, if you'd like to sit this way in profile, just to give yourself a rest, the meditation, the first one is one in which we'll have our eyes partially open. Um, and there's no reason why that can't be towards the screen, but if it would be more easeful for you to have a space <clears throat> maybe a little bit less uh, stimulating, then I encourage you to kind of either shift your computer or yourself to have that space. And for those of you who are not uh, on screen or for whom it's just more restful um, to be able to have that time to be, you know, making linguini alongside listening to the Dharma, I support you. I have been there, I get it. Uh, I, I hope that whatever way that you can receive this teaching and this time together tonight is supportive, right? Totally for you. So that is my hope, my aspiration for all of us. And, you know, really truly, even if you are, yeah, halfway making linguini and still refreshing the news from our very exciting and eventful day yet again, um, you can always put questions in the chat to us. We love to hear from you. These practices um, are simple and, and never easy. And any question that you have, I feel 100% certain that someone else will also have. So really inviting that. Um, Chandra, any other words before we move towards practice? So um, I had the great fortune, I'm Eve Ekman, by the way, I don't know if I said that. Um, I know you can see my name there, but uh, I had the great fortune to get about nine days of personal silent retreat and went deeply into one of the shared teachers that Chandra and I are so fortunate to have grown up with, <laughs> truly. And this is Alan Wallace, whose name we um, invoke quite a lot. He's an incredible scholar, translator, uh, teacher, and practitioner. And so I did about nine days of practice with him, really re-energized my appreciation for the precision of how he teaches exactly what we've been doing, the settling the mind in the natural state. And tonight, the kind of flavor or the angle that I'm going to offer and invite us all to engage with is one in which we focus on the quality of stillness and motion. And I've, I'm sure you've heard Chandra and I speak about this, but to really feel the sense of noticing the stillness of our awareness and then the motion of thoughts. And of course, the idea here is being able to train ourselves to the point where we can start to have more and more wider and wider glimpses of that stillness and yet not be perturbed or pushed off our center by the motion. So this is familiar, hopefully, um, as something that we've been kind of sharing and teaching. Two other aspects of it that he emphasized that were incredibly meaningful me, for me in practicing um, in this time off was he really emphasized that in order for us to kind of develop the quality of attention needed to recognize this, the motion and the stillness, we have to relax down to our very core, existentially relax. Actually a sense of looseness in the body and when we are able to sustain and, and even get a glimpse of this kind of looseness and this kind of uh, ability to feel that deep relaxation, whatever arises in the mind, whatever appearances, whatever thoughts, memories, and images, they unwind themselves. He uses this beautiful metaphor of it's like the cobra, which is in a basket tied in knots. What's the best way to get it out of knots? remove the basket, give it all the space it needs. And in the same way, when we can cultivate the stillness of our mind, we're actually creating the conditions for whatever arises to naturally free itself. So instead of sitting here and the thought arising of, did I respond to that email? Why does my knee hurt so much? What is my neighbor doing that is so loud? and being like, no, 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 not that thought, stop, stop, stop. 
we relax more deeply. We kind of look for or feel into that, that sense of spaciousness, right? Of, of that awareness that does feel still, primordially still. And importantly, as we are creating that sense of this kind of stillness, spaciousness, that it's done so with a loving presence, not with a sense of rigidity and tightness, with a loving presence. And I think in addition to the loving presence and the looseness, there's a way in which we can apply some methods to help us get there. And the methods are actually using noticing the motion of the breath through the body as a way to notice the motion of the mind. So that will be our practice tonight. I won't give more away. That was a lot of preamble, but I hope useful. So I invite you to <clears throat> importantly find the posture and also the gaze that will work for you. We'll start the practice with eyes closed, but again, we will be gently opening them midway through. Find your posture of dignity, your posture of integrity. This posture of uprightness and vividness. That tall, regal spine and that soft, gentle front. Settle the body, speech, and mind into their natural states. Allowing the body to fully come into stillness. Inviting the speech or inner narration to recede to the background as you attend to the natural rhythm of the breath. And invite your awareness to drop all the way down, freeing the mind to rest in natural spaciousness. Gently invite the attention to notice the tactile sensations throughout the body.
Find a warmth and a kindness with this attention. And start off early with this intention towards looseness, deep relaxation. You've already had plenty of time now to notice whatever thoughts or memories or images <clears throat> may be engaging you or pulling you away. Allowing this to be diagnostic of where you are in this moment. And consider an intention that's meaningful for this moment. Maybe it's to feel ease. Maybe the intention is to get more clarity, feel connected. Just for a moment, consider your intention for this practice here this evening. Allowing this intention to just gently recede into the background. And instead, let's bring our attention closely and vividly to noticing the breath throughout the body. Noticing all these areas of undulation and sensation, all this motion as the breath travels in and the breath travels out. While maintaining a sense of stillness in which this movement and undulation arises and falls. Notice the breath when it feels subtle. Notice the breath when it may feel more coarse. Notice this ever-changing motion.
and to refine our attention even further. We'll use one more method, noticing the motion of our breath and the stillness of our awareness. Each breath we move between finding the vividness and clarity of the inhale. And then allowing a relaxation and ease through the exhale. As we inhale, we refine, focus our attention. And as we exhale, it's not as though we become soggy or diffuse in our attention. We invite the quality of relaxation right into the breath. Very gently, shifting to have our eyes partially open, the gaze soft and expansive, not fixating on any point in front of you. Noticing the shift, the brightness and the vividness of light and color and shape and movement. Relaxing into this open eyed gaze. Continuing to relax, loosen deeply. Maintaining this awareness of stillness. Now noticing emotion of thoughts. Just as some of our breath is subtle and some is coarse, some of our thoughts are fast. Some of our thoughts are slow or diffuse. Without grasping onto them or becoming distracted by them, allowing them to simply arise, unknot themselves and naturally dissipate back from where they came. in this practice of settling the mind in its natural state. We're focusing on the space of the mind and whatever arises within it. If there are many thoughts, let them be many. If there are few, let them be few. Without interference, without an agenda, Rest in the stillness of your awareness. 
allowing the motion of thoughts. If you become carried away by a thought or memory or image, simply relax, release, and return, refreshing your interest. If you ever feel just too dull or too agitated, come back to noticing the breath, letting the eyes close, focusing back in, stabilizing and then returning. Notice if you become caught up in thoughts, carried away, or fallen into some dullness and lethargy. If it's the thoughts, then busyness. Invite more clarity. Again, focusing on the inhale. And if it's dullness, Continue focusing on that clarity where there is a lot of thoughts and proliferation, relax, find ease through the exhale.
Gently allow the eyes to close, soften, and refine this connection to the breath and all the tactile sensations that breathing generates through the body. Touching into that deep relaxation and that, that loving presence. Find your way home through the breath. Thank you all for your practice. We'd love to hear any questions or reflections folks have. Um, I have a question. Um, so I don't know if this is, yeah, like more of like the, the inner critic talking, but I just never know if I'm doing this type of practice right. <laughs> um, I don't really know what like that rightness is supposed to look like. That's as far as I have with that question. <laughs> I love that question. Um, yeah. Um, I'd be very curious what Chandra said, has to say, you know, my, my first, um, my first response, which is, you know, I, I've said this before, what Alan says 95% of the time to every question, relax. And I feel like there's, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, the doing it right. I have no idea if I've ever done it right. You know, I think there's a, um, there can definitely be a second guessing. But I do have a sense, at least again, through doing these practices recently and, and listening, listening and reading Alan is, it's really that relaxation, but without losing clarity. So it's like, and that it's so different because I, you know, we can reach these states and practice where you feel kind of warm and fuzzy and it's relaxed, but it's also diffuse. So I think there's just this like really particular quality of like relax clearly that to me is the more than anything i could uh describe that to me is the like sensational experience um yeah hope that helps eli <laughs> I love this question too. <clears throat> I think what Eve said is is so spot on, and and then uh, what I could add to that is um, <clears throat> a quality of stability that that is uh, it's kind of like you you become you feel like you're held in awareness. Um, 
that your awareness pervades everything you experience and space around you and in you, your <clears throat> perception. And it does have this quality of just utter release and joy. You know, maybe there's some joy in there. We could allow some joy in <laughs> if it comes knocking. Um, and yeah, and then, yeah, for me, that then it's the clarity, like, Usually from, and Alan teaches it this way, like relaxation, stability, and clarity. Those three characteristics of his practice are really important. And um, and I do kind of feel like them, like from the ground up, like relax the body, then stabilize the awareness, and then, oh, check in. Am I clear or am I foggy still? Am I kind of daydreaming? Because it's easy. I don't know about you all, but I can get kind of... Um, kind of like pleasantly numb and then and then ride that for a while until the bell rings and then I go okay yeah another day of just mediocre meditation you know but it was soothing and relaxing and um, so that's when like okay am I how where how's the clarity you know can I dial up the clarity a little bit so then it's like the sun rays pervading that awareness space so then it's kind of like you've got those three dials and from time to time with introspection you kind of little tweak of that little tweak of that little tweak, and then rest don't tweak <laughs> don't do uh, I like doing this one um, gazing towards the sky so I can this sp the outer space if you have access to sky I mentioned that last week if you do have access to the sky try to meditate out there and let the just the natural metaphor of the sky be a mirror for the sky-like nature of your own mind. And so that's another way of settling the mind in central state, just resting in that spacious uh, sky-like mind. So the, the eyes can be gazing down, they can be gazing straight ahead, they can be a little up, you can play with it. Sometimes, the, like Padmasambhava taught, teaches to look a little to the left for a while and relax, look a little to the right for a while. There's this whole kind of interesting stage, step-by-step -step progression with the eyes. But it's nice to do that when you've got the sky, but you don't have to do it outside. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, and then releasing the, like, is this right? You know, even rela relax that. Relax the looking, relax the that the thoughts that come evaluating and just open back up into the space because in this practice like we've said before you're not preferring one state over the other you're actually training and really being with whatever it is so if there's fatigue just let there be fatigue and view it right if there's striving just notice it release it and last thing is it, it is so much about relaxing again and again and again. It's like even the more you get adept with this, you notice subtle, it's like contractions of the mind around thought. And so deeper release, deeper release, opening and release. Yeah. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Well, I think for the sake of time, should we should we go to the next uh, phase, Eve? Or were there any other questions that we should answer, or are we good? That was like such the perfect meta question. It really was I, a good one, doesn't it? Yeah. It like a big umbrella <laughs> question. I'm sure we all benefited from that, hopefully. <laughs> I did. Um, okay, great. Okay, so here is our slogan. I'm going to get us kicked off, and then Eve's going gonna to continue with it. And uh, so this this first, how's the sound? I'm, I've got a kind of a funny setup tonight, um, but it's okay. Okay, great. So um, the 26th slogan is don't ponder others. Maybe I'll paste it. Did you, can you I paste did it. it? Did you already yeah. paste it? Yeah. Okay, it looks like you selected it. Great. Or another version is don't stand in judgment of others. Uh, the Tibetan is... Jen Chok Gang Yang Misa Mo. It's an interesting, it's fun to go back, for me at least, these short phrases to then look at how other translators have translated these Tibetan phrases over the years. Jen is the word for others. So Jen and then Chok is, is 
direction is literally like the word for direction. So it's like looking towards others, you know, moving in the direction of others, fixating on others, you could say. And then gang yang, gang yang is like whatever, like any. Uh, So whatever, like the way I would translate it is like anyone, right? So mi sum means don't think of, and then mo is like an imperative, like don't do it. So zhen chok, direction of others, gang yang, any, mi sum mo is don't think. So don't, it's like don't fixate your mind in the directions of others, (laughs) is a literal way to understand that. And so, you know, these translations are nice, they're more digestible for English speakers, but Really what this is saying is don't direct or fixate your attention and judgment and thoughts on what everybody else is doing, really, on anyone else. I like the gang yang here, which isn't really translated, but it's like gang yang, (laughs) like any others. And so what this is um, pointing towards is it actually is like what Eve said. This is kind of the sister slogan from last week, which was um, don't ponder. What was it? Don't talk about injured limbs. So the 25th slogan, don't talk about injured limbs, is more uh, focusing on our speech. You know, don't fixate on the negative. Don't talk about the negative. We went deep into that. And then this week is this don't 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 even think about others. <laughs> Not easy, uh, but it's pretty clear what it's trying to say. So, really, the subtlety is like think about how I'm sure we've thought about this before. It's such a deep teaching, such an important life lesson, which is you know if you've got one finger pointing out there, you've got three pointing back towards you, right? So in some way we need to just catch ourselves when we start fixating on others this slogan kicks me in the butt just like the last slogan did last week when I was preparing I was like oh I did that today well sure enough I did this today too <laughs> you know? and um and you know even when you say like I'm not gonna do that again you know I want to be a good Buddhist <laughs> I'm not gonna fixate on others faults but then there you go doing it again I'll speak for first person. There I go doing it again. (laughs) And um, that introspective quality that we're cultivating in meditation, like the dials, you know, when you know, okay, I'm a little dull, let's tune it up the clarity. Oh, I'm a little excited and hyper, a little active mind, let's tone it down. That quality that we have that's so brilliant is this introspective quality. It's called zhejin in Tibetan. And we need to use that when we're in implementing this slogan as well. Because, you know, when we're fixating on the negative, it actually kind of poisons us, doesn't it? It's, it doesn't, it's, it's a little toxic. That's how I feel it. I don't, I don't like it. But then there's also, of course, we need to not get stuck in self-judgment. Um, inevitably, these things happen. And, um, really just like in meditation developing the the capacity to view it to see it and to go oh yeah i see you like i think we've talked about in the past like oh like the buddha said to mara who tried to tempt him out of pursuing his path to enlightenment from time to time mara would poke up appear in his life and try to distract him away and uh, siddhartha would say mara i see you So we need to train up in that, like, oh, Mara, I see you. There you go, fixating on out there, uh, others in particular, and their faults. So rather than getting too wrapped up in, in the psychology of it, this approach is saying view it, label it, thought or judgment, whatever you want to label it as. Breathe into that. So then breathe, like, oh, here I am. I'm doing that thing that I'm trying not to do rather than constricting and getting all self-deprecating, we're training up and being able to pause and breathe into it. And then like Tonglen, right? 
we can breathe it in. So even breathing in this so-called negativity or judgment or mistake, we can breathe it in, bringing it into the heart, and then exhale, release, and, and release it, you know. Maybe just give some self-love, some patience, take a breath, take a pause, and recognize, wow, okay, it's probably true that if I'm that judgmental with all those people out there, I probably direct some of that to myself. And it's a very humbling thing when you start to realize how hard we are on ourselves. It's it's really kind of abusive, actually. It can be, like, harsh. So this this first step is, like, in a sense, using the opportunity for the projection to turn that light of projection back in upon yourself and going, okay, you know, I'm probably doing that to myself. Can I breathe into that and relax and let myself off the hook? Don't need to be so critical in here either. So a form of self tonglen, meaning that when you feel frustration or judgment coming up towards another or towards yourself, just feel that feeling. Pause, breathe, and breathe it into that heart chakra that we've become familiar with in these practices of Tonglen. Allow it to have some space to come home and then feel, I like to feel where I'm holding tension because judgment, critic, definitely lives somewhere in your body, right? Your issues are in your tissues. (laughs) And, uh, you know, for me, I feel it all along the base of the skull and the jaw. So then I'm exhaling and releasing and softening and remembering a more spacious feeling inside. So let it be somatic. And then the next invitation is to then maybe feel, feel like if you are really caught in critic criticizing someone else, exchange yourself for them. Like put yourself in their shoes. Uh, put yourself in their position. You know, God, maybe you know, maybe I'd be having a hard time like they are if I were in their situation. This is tong- this is an f- important part of Tonglen and compassion training, is being able to exchange yourself for others, even if it's, you know, obviously in the imaginary realm. Like, how would it feel to be this person? Exchanging yourself for the other, thinking, well, if I were in that position, it would be challenging for me too, perhaps. So put yourself in their shoes. How would I feel? You could also do Tonglen for them, right? So this is the training. Like I've said before, we are training to be this kind of spiritual warrior. I don't know if I love that phrase, but it's kind of fun, right? This bodhicitta practitioners where everything is arising as an opportunity to practice. Everything. Even these annoying people (laughs) out there. (laughs) And so... Practice Tonglen for them in the moment. Like a, like train yourself. Instead of feeding the negativity and those habit patterns, can you pause, breathe, and realize, oh, I've got a tool for this. What would it be like to practice Tonglen for this person that I want to, you know, yell at right now or criticize? And then lastly, could you even feel gratitude for them person that you're being critical towards maybe you could apply this to yourself thank you for giving me the chance to practice patience (laughs) thank you for for the opportunity to put my compassion training to the test there's certain spaces where we can open into that it's not always accessible and it's okay if you're not quite there it's totally fine You can do one of the prior exercises I've been kind of listing off here. So, didn't we already cover be grateful to everyone? I think we already did that one. That's, that can come in here a little bit, that slogan. Remember this, the commentary on that one? It's like, even your enemies, they say, we can be grateful for our enemies even more than the buddhas and our teachers the enlightened beings because it's the so-called enemies who really put our practice to the test and therefore we can be grateful to them that's a pretty big stretch but that's kind of the mood the flavor and the the logic that the lojong and the tonglen um, operate from 
how am I doing with time? It looks like I'm just a little bit there. My time. Um, a few extra minutes, right? You've, you've built in a few. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, this slogan is linked to the one above, meaning that, you know, the one above was more about speech. So, you know, negative speech, critical speech can make the mind, can influence the mind, the mental states, make it critical. And likewise, a critical mind can bring critical or harsh speech. So be, be aware of these two slogans as kind of sister slogans here mind and, and speech and how how what's in our minds you know can really come out through speech in either positive negative or neutral ways um, so being being mindful of that conscientious of that and also just being aware that this kind of criticizing or f being um, thinking of others faults even not criticizing but fixating on on faults the negative how many people f have noticed they kind of fixate on the negative? <laughs> yeah, hi. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like a habit. It's kind of an addiction. So seeing that is like an addiction. And, and then trying to forge new pathways. That's what mantra is. And at the end of class, we'll do some mantra. We'll do a Saraswati mantra. And I've got my harmonium out. That's why I'm sitting in a different way tonight. So we're going to do a little... I figured after today, wow, I, I, I've been steamrolled today by not only what's happening in the world, the great news in the morning and then the horrible news in the afternoon. And um, then my own biz my own work life was just totally overwhelming. So I think chanting is a great thing, way to end the day. So Eve was so wonderful. She asked about this mantra that we both love. So we'll do that tonight. And mantra, it literally is meant to be mind protection. It, that's what it means. Mantra. Manas is m the root for man. And then tra means to protect. So mind protection. So I like to use mantra when I'm stuck in a negative rut, you know, pattern. Click out of it with some O Mani Pami Hum. O Mani Pami Hum. O Mani Pami Hum. O Mani Pami Hum. And see how that feels. How does it shift you? Or Om Tari Tutari Ture Swaha. Om Tari Tutari Ture Swaha. Remember what it means, what it feels like, what these energies feel like to invite into your space. So, and at the same time, we don't want to reject critical intelligence, right? So it's important also to have discernment. So this is kind of the middle path of not suppressing and not feeding it. So we're just kind of noticing and allowing and then applying some of our tools if we need to. Breathe with it. Do a little self-tonglen or tonglen for the other. Or put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. Or, even, or practice gratitude, right? We could call this a gratitude practice. Or mantra even, right? So there's different tools. You have all these wonderful tools to discern, okay, I don't need to feed that right now. I don't need to act on it, but I can do some other work around that. So getting interested in also what's underneath the critic. What is really wanting to be said there? Do you want to be seen? Do you want to be right? Do you feel unsafe? Are you feeling a lack of love, right? Like, what's the tender spot underneath all that? Get interested in that. Yeah, I think that's good for now. Eve, I'd love to hear hear from you about this one. Yeah, that's thank so you. Rich. Chandra, so beautiful. Uh, I really appreciate not only laying out all the kind of pathways, right? All the ways in which this can be understood and interpreted, but all the ways that we have some power, we have some efficacy. Um, yeah, I... I <laughs> I, I know I say this a lot on Wednesdays, but like, can you think of a better slogan for tonight? <laughs> I mean, are we serious here? It's really amazing. You know, the slogan is about not judging others. And um, I, I want to remain, um, you know, not inflaming of our news and politics and making it worse. Um, I will say that, you know, when I heard what was going on at the Capitol, 
I wasn't curious, like, huh, I wonder why that's happening. And I wasn't like, oh, that sounds like some people must be suffering. I was like, there was a judgment about what was happening and why. And it was immediate. You know, it felt when I think about applying this teaching to that, I don't know, one fifth of a second when I was taking in what was happening and responding internally with judgment, it can feel really overwhelming. And I think the idea of aspiring to these slogans, we, we have to keep that in mind. They are really hard. They are really hard, really challenging. And yet they uphold us. They kind of lift us up to the possibility of where we might try to find a way to cultivate our mind. And, you know, having, having the humility around the challenge of it is so important and to even, you know, be able to laugh at it. You know, I do think <clears throat> this slogan points a lot to, as Chandra was speaking to, the dangers of poisoning our own mind with this kind of judgment. Of course, the mirror of if we are judging someone or others so harshly, so, so quickly, of course, that's what we're doing to ourselves. That's a familiar pattern for us. And I think what we see here is that, you know, this is exactly the way of being that leads to polarization. That immediate judgment, no curiosity, no generosity, immediate judgment, just as a habit, not even like, Ooh, I'm going to do something naughty. I'm going to be judgmental, but just that's how I am. <laughs> This is how I think. This is how I move through the world, right? Without any moment. So when I think of this um, slogan and I think of what, what I can, you know, invite for myself, it's maybe to even just notice the judgment. Get a bit like more curious, a bit more thoughtful of um, when is this happening? How fast is it? What is the impact on my body? What's the impact on my digestion? What's the impact on my sleep cycle, right? Because a lot of these judgments, you know, it's so interesting about this being the slogan in which we're invited to reflect upon the mind as opposed to maybe what is said or done. Nothing like those ruminative thoughts of being right and someone else being wrong to really get into our sleep cycle right? I feel like waking up in the night being like, I'm so right. They're so wrong. That's a familiar feeling. That is like so funny. Um, that feeling can really, really just haunt us so closely. And when I think of um, what is the emotion kind of built within the judgment, it's contempt, right? And as many of you know, I, I really love the world of emotion and kind of getting as fine grained as we can with our emotions. And contempt is just such a, a fascinating emotion. I, I would say it's um, one of the least commonly understood and possibly most important emotions of our time. And I say so because contempt is the emotion that asserts superiority. Contempt has within it an assumption that I know better than you. And contempt, <clears throat> interestingly, it is a um, emotion that's shared by our primate relatives. So it's a universal emotion. And the way that it's expressed in kind of primate culture, um, not just who's storming the White House contempt, right, towards them. Um, it's, it's interestingly, one example that's often cited in the research is you have a very established uh, chimpanzee, uh, and he is um, incredibly uh, powerful, and no one has stood up to him and you know been able to overcome him. And then this little junior chimpanzee, this like juvenile, comes up, beats his chest, kind of challenging this huge chimpanzee to to a duel, and he's not angry. He's not sad and he's not annoyed. It's contempt. It's like, you're going to challenge me? The judgment, right? And, and the facial expression, which you, shot, you just saw me demonstrate there. And what's interesting about that is contempt from the evolutionary perspective, it's quite useful. 
because our anger is actually more exhausting. Our contempt, we can like preserve some energy. With anger, we might get into an actual fight. There might be aggression. With contempt, we are safely and securely above and better than another. And that is, um, that is the kind of nasty secret of contempt is it kind of feels good. And we have to be a little honest about that if we want to really get onto ourselves about that. That when we feel contempt or better than others, we feel kind of safe. We're not like angry, like, why well, I gotta change something? Something's gotta happen. We're just kind of, hmm, yeah, I'm, I'm better and I'm right. Um, and that can exacerbate itself a bit um, and become that more kind of unsettled feeling. But contempt is like that very first feeling of superiority. Um, I'm looking at the chat here from Walt. Uh, we can have compassion and empathy regarding others' suffering, such as the capital mob, but compassion and empathy without action. What can I do about this? Um, to relieve their suffering is worthless self-aggrandizement. <laughs> yes. And then I think a joke, how dare you without doing anything? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I think the whole path as Chandra was saying of, of becoming a, a warrior of compassion is how can we most effectively be of service to others? Is it with our contorted mind of anger and contempt? Or is it with some sort of mental clarity that we can move forward decisively? And that's why it's so important that we are revisiting and setting our intention every single practice, every single practice. Why are we doing this? To what purpose? Is it just so that we can feel better? Or is it truly for this transformation of all beings? Um, so when we think of uh, contempt, especially, what we are actually creating what we're developing the kind of causes and conditions for is that someone else will experience shame. And I think it's important to realize the consequence of our judgment. Like we, we don't wanna do it because of course we wanna become woken up uh, warriors of compassion. We, we don't wanna be you know, held down by these experiences, but also really taking into mind as Chandra was inviting us to do of what is it like for this person who we feel contempt for? What is their experience? Our contempt, if it is experienced and received by another, will make them feel shame. Some of the work I've gotten to do in, in healthcare environments, and we talk a lot about contempt uh, for colleagues, not just in healthcare, of course, this is everywhere. But when you have people expressing contempt to their colleagues, you're creating a culture of shame where people just feel like they're gonna be judged harshly and that they, they believe they've done something terribly wrong or are wrong themselves. So it's really, you know, um, I'd say quite tender and it directly kind of loops or links back into, also as Chandra was pointing us, that why are we judging? What is that arising from? Our own sense of unworthiness? Some of our own worry of being not good enough? Maybe having some shame ourselves? So it's, it's a really um, interesting kind of, mm, I would say like uh, synergistic experience with contempt and shame. And just not safe. Right? Like, how can we feel any safety when there is such this experience of maybe being judged ourselves, judging others, maybe being judged ourselves, judging others? It's, it's, it's unrelenting. It's like middle school. Um, <laughs> right? When it's just, for some of us, a feeling of being constantly observed and um, that can feel quite self conscious. Um, and <clears throat> with this judgment, again, kind of pulling it all together here, the judgment itself, this idea of superiority or I know better than them, even if we aren't acting on it, even if we aren't saying anything, just holding in our mind the judgment, it's a barrier to compassion and empathy. 
we feel superior thereby we're not interested in what's happening for them because we already know we already know we're better we already know better than them so it's a real obstacle to our um, our ability to actually understand what's happening for another person so i think it's really useful to bring these practices home and think about where is this happening and you know it's uh Chandra and I had a good giggle <laughs> in preparing for this evening together around the great teachers that are the partners we live with. And I think we see a lot of judgment, not only that we speak to them, but that we hold in our mind, right? And this, you know, we are kind of sometimes consciously and sometimes not really consciously developing our case, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like thinking about the ways they do those things and they're always doing it that way. And, you know, you, you end up kind of um, developing some real resentment, right? And even again, you haven't, you haven't said anything, you haven't done anything, but holding in judgment this person who you see day in and day out, oh my God, it creates so much blockage, so much accumulated garbage in there. So then, you know, something very small happens and this just force of that accumulated judgment and resentment. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody? Yes, like, yeah, like at least once a day. Um, I hope not that true, but sometimes that can be true. Um, yeah, um, I got a, a message here, private one. Um, Contempt for the capital is a bleed over from seeing how what they did today was wrong and misinformed. Very likely would target me if, if left to their own devices. I hold them away from me because judgment sometimes feels like the only protection I actually have. Thank you for sharing that. And I, yeah, I, I know that. <clears throat> and that's a very tender feeling to feel vulnerable and to feel as though the only way that we might actually be safe is to kind of hold distance and judgment. It, you know, opening ourselves to compassion towards people who are toxic is very threatening. And people often feel that with Tong Glenn. You're telling me to open myself to that. I don't want that in here. I don't want that in here, right? And it's, um, you know, I think we, we tread lightly and we go slowly and we only know if we are uh, going too far, unfortunately, if we're getting a little sore, if we're feeling a little beat up maybe and kind of have to pull back and be protective. And I do think, you know, it's really, um, it's really meaningful to consider like what is self-protection and what are, where are the anchors that we can find a sense of self-protection? And if that's contempt for a while, like, great. Then maybe we start to like explore others and, and see if there's other options. My other immediate feeling of judgment and contempt today with the news was just like, wow, are we gonna run out of new things to be horrified by? I, get, I guess not, um, you know, just this kind of ongoing um, cascade experience. And um, I see Tanya writes here, I'm very scared for our country and our government. Today is really hard. Thank you, Tanya, for sharing that. And Walt, I'm black. They've always been after me. If you aren't black, welcome to the club. Yeah, there's, you know, there is a lot of hurt and a lot of, I would say, um, momentum of hurt and pain and threat in this country. And for some of us, this feels newer and for others of us, it feels familiar and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Better parties in the club, I like that. Oh, yeah.
Yeah, you know, it's really, I'm just like taking a moment here to recognize that it is a huge ask this slogan is making of us. It's a huge ask. Holding open with compassion. Being curious about our judgment. But the alternatives are so much worse, right? Another teacher that Chandra and I share, Jennifer Wellwood, says it's not about, you know, choosing between what's right and what's wrong or what's good and what's bad or what's hard and what's easy. It's what's terrible and what's worse. <laughs> you know, and, and terrible is feeling contempt, judgment and hatred. Um, I'm sorry, what's worse is feeling content, judgment, and hatred. What's terrible is trying to feel compassion. Um, it's really hard, you know, for people who are toxic and harmful. Um, I see that Joe raised his hand. Yeah, sorry, I would have put it in the chat, but I just don't know how to write it out clearly. Um, I would love it if you can comment on how to use this Buddhist ethic of compassion in a way that promotes social action and organizing because things like contempt and indignation and anger are actually incredibly important. Um, and I noticed that Buddhism gets misused in my opinion to diffuse what are appropriate responses to intolerable and insufferable injustices um, and kind of promote like a compromising middle sorry i'm going off but how do you <laughs> how do you promote the the compassion in your heart whilst doing the action that makes it all worthwhile and that's the only way that these actual rifts in our country will heal it's not going to be from sitting here wishing each other well it's from transformative action yeah my questions to you would be like what do you think because i i think they're not separate right? It's not separate. The work we do here, the work we do in the world. Um, and I think it's, it, can be, it can be hard when we try to create distinctions between them, right? There's, I, I don't think, again, if our intention is always focused on transformation, right, and reducing suffering for all beings, um, it's just like how to avoid the burnout, um, I think is a big aspect of what we do. Um, and I do think that any emotion can be enacted in a way that's destructive or constructive. So we can enact our anger in a way that's so harmful. Um, and we can enact our anger in a way that is so constructive. And you're right, it's the crux of social justice movements. So it's funny, because again, it's like coming back to clarifying our intention and remembering and remembering and remembering every time why we're here and what we're here for. Um, but I want to hear from Chandra. No, oh. oh, these great, great questions and comments in the chat. And, you know, I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers here, but um, I'm definitely very committed to balancing my contemplative practice with activism. And I've been trying to do that as best as I can as the years go by and learning more and um, we you know even way back in the time of the Buddha the Buddha went against against the caste system you know so Buddhism had this root of justice and equality and seeing that all of us have that intrinsic you know kind of Buddha nature is how Buddha would put it but um, and Tonglen and Lojong is also, I feel like, a, a good preparation for and maintenance for racial and social justice or any forms of justice that you feel called to to engage in. Because we learn through the through these contemplations, through these teachings and the slogans from the beginning to the end. You know, I don't know if people have been here through the whole time, but the first five or six slogans talk about interconnectedness you know how we are all interconnected and my liberation is wrapped up in your liberation and in the path of the bodhisattva is a path where you vow not to actually like go to nirvana or leave samsara until all beings are free so it's like this impossible commitment but we do it anyway 
And so anyone who just kind of thinks that, that Buddhism is just a kind of individualistic or self-centered practice is probably not had good enough teachers who've really showed them that um, at the root of Buddhism is a lot of engaged activism. If you want to learn more, I'd read Thich Nhat Hanh's writings around engaged Buddhism and read Radical Dharma, also a really important book around liberatory ideologies, both from within Buddhism, but also within uh, racial justice and, and gender justice. So there's a lot of really great thinkers out there who are doing a lot of good work, uh, like um, Lama Rod Owens and uh, Zenju Williams and uh, Angel Kyoto Williams. Um, Zenju, I think I said Zenju's last name wrong. Uh, Zenju Earthland Manuel, I think, is her name too. So a lot of really important black Buddhist uh, writers we should read and learn from because... Uh, one thing as white folks, which I know there are a lot of white people on this call, should do is really do that reading and, and understand how um, kind of more modern, innovative uh, black Buddhist authors and teachers are translating Buddhist teaching into racial justice work. It's really deep and good. And for me, it's like the most exciting edge, growing edge of Buddhism in the West right now. And so there's a lot there to learn from and to be humble in and to stay engaged in. And it gives some kind of bridge for, for the personal inner journey, but also not going to sleep on the cushion, but finding ways to balance your practice with activism. So for me, my motto is 50%. So 50% inner cultivation, 50% like, like looking out there, like actually fixating on others. Like, how do I help? How can I be of most help? You know, what are my tools that I can offer or at least bring to the situation so that I can be of some kind of help and stumble through that, you know, with humility? <laughs> um, yeah, Stephen's saying Lama Rod Owens has a weekend workshop coming up at CIS around using anger as a path of, to liberation. Yeah, his path, his new book, uh, Love and Rage, is really good. Really great book. That's an important book to read check out his talks online and he's also teaching at Tara Mandala I think the SF Dharma Collective should invite him I don't know if you have tried already he's probably in high demand right now but um, we should invite him to give some talks um, yeah and Larry Yang really important um, uh, teacher who was spirit rock but then did it, it kind of spun off and created the the East Bay Meditation Center as a way and they don't they have a diverse teaching team you know like as a white teacher I can't just go teach there alone I'd have to at least teach with a person of color or or a person of color needs to be teaching alone it's good because it's it's important to uh, you know give the mic to more perspectives and more more experiences and diverse people so that's my long-winded answer I hope that was helpful and um, yeah, and today is a day of thinking about that. Like, I, I'm just going to be 100% honest. Maybe I avoided this topic because I haven't integrated it, but I'm still very much in judgment of the people who stormed the Capitol, and I'm in judgment of the government who didn't put up enough natural National Guard to protect the Capitol, whereas they did put up a lot, you know, way too much protection for Black Lives Matter protests you know there's a huge imbalance and this is not this teaching is not saying to be passive with stuff like that it's saying to cultivate that critical intelligence right so we can know we can tell when it's time to look inside and go you know maybe that anger or judgment doesn't really isn't really helping right now but there are other times where we can go oh yeah no here's my boundary and I'm drawing that boundary because I'm critical and judgmental of you right now because I don't agree with you or I don't feel safe around you and I appreciated what, what Walt said earlier, which is that, uh, what was that? Um, he said, yeah, the alternative is worse because I hate, if I hate them, then I become them. So that's a lot of wisdom in there and spoken from firsthand experience. And, and in a way, like, the I, I don't know if the woman who wrote that she doesn't trust the government and doesn't feel safe, I don't know if she's white or person of color, 
But if if she were white, um, it's kind of like, okay, good. Now you, like me, get to be in other people's shoes that I haven't been in before. So now I get to feel what it's like to feel unsafe with the police. Or So that's another form of Donglin and Lojong. Like, okay, now I'm in the other shoes. Good learning experience. Let's wake up through that. Exchanging self for others. Seeing others as equal. The first step of that practice is to see others as equal to you. I mean, that's a great justice training. I think within this, you could do a whole, a whole curriculum. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, around social justice activism and really train up our capacities for that work. Okay, I know we're nearing the end of time, and I've got my harmonium and my mics all set up. I mean, should we do it? <laughs> Let's do it. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm going to paste. Thanks for a really important and healing discussion. I hope that this, um, I'm sure there are a lot of things that could be said and more than just uh, what, what Eve and I can give. But uh, I think for the sake of time, we should chant to the divine goddess, Saraswati who is the goddess of wisdom, so we can ask for her blessings to grant us wisdom on how and ways to navigate these uh, turbulent waters right now. And in fact, her name literally means water, flow, river. There was an ancient uh, river in India called Saraswati River, but it dried up. It no longer exists. But she also um, is the kind of like the saint, you could say, or the archetype the goddess of wisdom, learning, the arts. So music, painting, sculpture, poetry, composition. Often she's prayed to at the beginning of ever, any scholarly endeavor. Uh, there are prayers that say, may Saraswati abide on my, remain on my tongue throughout the day so I speak with eloquence. And so this mantra is Om. Aim. It's really Aim is her one of her seed syllables, which is like a seed, uh, a syllable that contains the essence of the deity. So Aim. And then her name, Saraswati, to Saraswati, Namaha, I bow, I name her, I, I'm bowing and honoring her through naming her. So that first line is done twice. And then the second line is gone through once. Again, Om Aim. Saraswatiye, Saraswatiye, Saraswatiye Namaha, Om. This is a melody that um, that I've learned from uh, from Krishna Das, actually, who learned it from a a Russian songwriter. Who apparently he's like the Bob Dylan of Russia. <laughs> His name is Boris Bravinchikov. You can search this melody on Spotify. Krishnadas has a nice recording of it. Okay, so let's take some breaths and release to the belly. And you can listen at first and then join in as you like. Really open the heart, open the, the voice as we've done the last couple of weeks. We're really using this as a way to open the heart to blessings of the sound, the mantra, the deity, the Saraswati. And may her blessings rain down on all beings everywhere. May wisdom prevail.
Aing Saraswati Namaha. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure and an honor to spend tonight with you. May Saraswati's uh, wisdom reign, quench the thirst, and put out the fires of hatred. And may we really, as uh, Warnock, Reverend Warnock said, may this be a new morning, <laughs> a new dawn. And uh, thank you, everyone. May it be so. Let's say goodbye if you want to uh, unmute and bring your voice into the space. That's always thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Emma, oh. Thank you so thank much. You. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.